Okay, I'm ready. Fire away. Country roads take me home to the place I belong. West Virginia, now to mama. Country roads take me home. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Breaking Brews Podcast, a podcast focused on the business side of beer and what's driving today's thriving craft beer industry. Whether you're one of the thousands of people making craft beer what it is today, or just love great beer and want to know more about it, this show is here to cover everything from sales, marketing, branding, culture, and much, much more. The Breaking Brews Podcast delivers real-life scenarios and experiences from industry professionals that will help your beer knowledge evolve. To tap into more great beer content, visit BreakingBrews.com today. And now, the moment you've been waiting for. Let's get this session started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Breaking Brews podcast. I'm your host, Jason Serco. If you haven't done so already... Jump back in the archives. There are 21 fresh sessions of the Breaking Brews podcast waiting there just for you. If you like what you hear, jump over to iTunes, leave a rating, leave a review. Let me know how I'm doing with the show and help the podcast find the ears of more thirsty beer enthusiasts and thirsty beer professionals just like you. You can subscribe to the Breaking Brews podcast on Stitcher, on iTunes, on Spotify, and on Google Play Music. And you can stay up to date on everything about the show, including show notes and more, at breakingbrews.com slash podcast. All right, guys, session 22 is ahead of us today, and we are talking with Mr. Brendan Carroll of CNC Malt. I'd like to thank Brendan's son, Duke, for kicking off the show with his rendition of Country Roads. It was great to have both those guys give me a tour of the CNC malt factory in Fenelton, Pennsylvania, and also educate me, as Brendan will also do for you, on the process of malting. They've got a great setup happening in Fenelton. They bought an old elementary school, which you're going to hear about during the show, and they've repurposed it as a malt house. So we're going to dive deep into this aspect of the beer producing process This is part of a mini-series I'd like to do here on the Breaking Brews podcast that will break down all the ingredients that go into making a beer. So in the future, you're going to be hearing episodes about hops, you're going to be hearing episodes about water, and you'll be hearing episodes about yeast. So we're going to get a full, well-rounded picture of how beer comes to life. So today, Brendan's going to break down the malting process. He's going to talk about what they do at CNC to really add the soul to the beers that we drink and enjoy every single day. So good stuff lies ahead. I'm going to let you guys dig right in. This is Session 22 of the Breaking Brews Podcast with Brendan Carroll of CNC Malting Company. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We are at C and C Malting Company in Butler, Pennsylvania. Actually, we're a little outside of Butler, aren't we? Yeah, it's still Butler County. We're kind okay. of right in the middle of Butler and Catanning. All right, four twenty-two. The town's called Fenelton. Fenelton. All right. So for all of you Pittsburgh and out outskirt explorers, check out Fenelton. Lots happening up here. I saw a couple farms on my way out and almost hit a deer. That was fun on the on the drive down the back road, but lots of good stuff happening here at CNC Malt. I'm joined by the owner, Brendan Carroll, and today's episode is going to dive deep into the malting process. This is going to be the first in a series of podcasts that take a look at different ingredients in beer, and Brendan has graciously taken some time out of his day to talk to us about the malting process, how it adds life to beer, how, as he said as we were speaking earlier, how it's the soul of every beer that we drink. So lots of good things to talk about and looking forward to picking Brendan's brain about everything. Before we get started, Brendan, why don't you give us some background on yourself? Yeah, sure. So I got into beer at a very early age, uh, about 14 or so I started making beer. And it uh, came about that process because it's very hard to buy beer when you're 
14, but you can buy the ingredients. It's so. true. You can pull it off, but it's super right, tricky. Right, And, uh, you know, fake mustaches and that just don't do the trick. So. <laughs> uh, brewed for a while and um, eventually got caught by my parents, and then they embraced that pastime of mine, I guess you'd say, and helped support me. So at that point, we started culturing our own yeast. We grew our own hops. We did everything except for malt. And looking at malting, it was just the... Um, it was a lot of work, and malt wasn't very expensive, so it just didn't seem worth the effort. Um, so fast forward, I guess this might cut into how I got into malting. So I always liked beer. I always liked brewing. Uh, did uh, a couple other, like everyone else in life, we work a few jobs here and there and uh, go about our professional lives, and that kind of changed. And so I had an opportunity where I could potentially get into brewing for real. Mm -hmm. and I had picked up quite a bit of equipment throughout uh, my life, so I have about uh, enough stuff to do, a five-barrel Frankenstein-type brewery. And I searched in a mill, came across some malting equipment, and I said, oh, that'd be great. I could be the uh, the guy who makes my own malt for my beer and, you know, something a little different. And I started searching for Pennsylvania malt. At that time, there wasn't a single operating malt house in Pennsylvania. What was the time frame on this? Oh, well, that would have been 2014 about. Okay. Um, so there was Penn's Malt, and he was uh, starting to get going, but wasn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. So went out, visited him, him, went up to uh, Valley Malting up in Massachusetts, and uh, checked out all these other malt houses. And I said, well, all right, this is what I want to do. I don't want to make beer. I want to malt. And then I could visit all the breweries, taste all the beer, and um, get to see what everyone's up to. So it seemed Yeah, and in, in, in a way, have a hand in all of those beers. If Absolutely, if yeah. If it's coming through your company, that's cool. Because uh, traditionally, malt houses and breweries were married. You wouldn't have one without the other. And uh, as you start malting, you could kind of really see why. Uh, you do have a lot of control of the finished product. Mm -hmm. And you also learn more about uh, seasonal changes, too. So, for example, now that it's getting warmer, this is going to be the time of year we start making our Munich malts for Oktoberfest beers, yeah. which would be brewed in july august time frame so you're about two three seasons ahead of what's actually happening on the malt side so it gives you a little more insight into traditional styles and uh, historical points when you were visiting all these malt houses when did it hit you that this is the part of the industry that you wanted to zero in on probably even before i went and started uh, visiting them it uh, just started uh, looking for, uh, again, Pennsylvania malt, and there wasn't any. And then I started looking mm -hmm. at Pennsylvania barley, and it was somewhat limited. But there is barley available in Pennsylvania. And um, it just, uh, it, searching equipment, and there really wasn't equipment either, so we had to make our <laughs> own. Um, so kind of going into a whole area that supplies the the booming folks and um i'm not behind a microphone now not in a spotlight i'm not a spotlight kind of guy i like to support people and see them do well yeah uh, i don't necessarily need the the fame and fortune that goes with it so <laughs> it was kind of uh it was right up my alley to be the behind the scenes kind of guy making stuff happen and being that uh, no one else was in it seemed like a, a good space to head for absolutely yeah you've definitely got a nice corner of the market here in western pennsylvania I, and like you said there wasn't anything when you were starting and no one has really followed in your footsteps up to this point if i'm if i'm not there, mistaken there's uh two other malt houses west of state college area i guess so okay. one in johnstown and one up uh north of sandy lake so they're kind of heading more towards erie area yeah so and the almost centralish area yeah, yeah more central so very cool so give us the lowdown on CNC Malt. What, what was the inspiration for the name? And tell us all about your operations here. So CNC stands for Custom and Craft Maltings. And so we um, do a lot of malt on, uh, to prepare for what brewers might need. And so that's kind of the craft part of it. So we'd stock the basic uh, Pilsner, Pale Ale, Munich's, Vienna, stuff like that. Uh, we also do custom stuff. So if someone dreams up, hey, we want uh, spelts and we want uh, spelts, chocolate spelts, okay, well, we'll see what we could do. So it's um, there's no request that we won't try. 
now it uh, might take us time to find the uh, raw material and to uh, actually get it to whatever the desired point is but uh, we want to be flexible where if you um, say any brewery in Pittsburgh really called up uh, Brees and said hey yeah we want chocolate spelts if they have it then they'll give you the lot number and here order this if not they're not going to make it for you Mm -hmm. so we wanted to help brewers have uh, more control in their finished product so are you working with breweries outside of the borders of pennsylvania and as things continue to progress you have plans to increase that distribution channel for your product? Uh, yeah especially you know ohio being right here it's uh, just as close to get to ohio as it is to get to yeah very true state college or anywhere else right uh, we did do a uh, collaboration brew with Madison River Brewing out of Bozeman, Montana. It was this uh, delicious smoked porter we did, and that was back in February, January, February time frame. Mm-hmm. So, yes, we do, and uh, we're looking to expand further as we have the capacity to uh, not only keep up with the customers here, but to... Um, to help support other breweries elsewhere, give them the taste of Pennsylvania. So in our conversations, like I said, when I was getting ready for this episode, I did some research just to learn more about malts. And I think you and I can both agree that it's typically not the sexiest ingredient that people look for when they're thinking about beer. Typically hops take center stage, but as we both have discussed and as anybody listening to this episode should know, malt is a an extremely important part of the process and, and part of the overall final product that you're drinking every single day. So let's talk about this in regards to resources. So in learning how to do this, what resources do you refer to? And then for our listeners out there, would these be good resources if they wanted to learn more about this process mm-hmm. as well? Not so much if they wanted to go down the road of actually doing it, but just to enhance their knowledge. Where would you point people towards? So with the Brewers Association, there's the book of the the four elements of brewing, and malts is one of them, written by John Mallett. Mm-hmm. So from a brewer's perspective, that's a, a good resource. To get into more detail on malting, there's the um, there's uh, several books out there. Briggs writes one. He's a, an Englishman, and that's uh, called uh, Malts and Malting, I believe. And so that uh, takes a very scientific and technical dive into the biochemistry going on in the malting, and takes a little look at uh, equipment and technology. The uh, Craft Maltsters Guild is an excellent resource if they're really interested in malt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, like anything, you can find all these online. Um, There's several other books out there, too, that are very good. Um, School-wise, there's a a university in Canada that's uh, about a two-week course that dives into malting pretty deep. Uh, North Dakota offers a three-day course, short course on small grains and malting. Um, and then through the Guild, uh, Hartwick College in New York usually offers a um, a course in malting as well, about a week-long course. And, of course, you could fly over the pond and go to UK or Germany <laughs> and learn about malting as well. Yeah, no, it's good to hear there's a lot of resources out there because, again, from you know, I don't brew, but at the same time, I'm trying to learn as much about this liquid as possible. For those in the industry that are producing their own beer and you know whether they're involved with the brewery on that on the production level or on the ownership level, having this knowledge to me just seems like it's it, 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 it's extremely valuable. So there you go, guys. You've got a lot of resources you can reach out to to check out. So I want to get into the technical aspects of this, what goes on here at CNC Malt and at malt houses across the world. So let's get into this from A to Z. So let's start from the very beginning with what is malting? Okay. So we'll start with the, the core of malting because there's stuff that happens on both ends that's not uh, critical. Um, it is critical, but it's uh, you'll still have malt with or without uh, the ancillary processes. So there's three main steps in malting. There's steeping, there's germination, and there's kilning. So when you get uh, barley out of storage or whatever cereal grain it is you're working with, it's going to be at a lower moisture content to preserve it for storage. Mm-hmm. You have to get it up from roughly 12% moisture to about 45% moisture. So you do that by soaking it in water. 
um, funny side story on that one. Talk about other grains, but some of them float. So yeah. <laughs> um, basically, you put it under water. Uh, it takes up the water. Uh, moisture content rises. And after a period of being underwater, then you take it and you uh, spread it out and let it grow. And while it's growing, it's uh, modifying the kernel, it's creating enzymes, it's breaking down the cell walls, it's making the the grain into something the brewers could use for beer uh, with the traditional one-step kind of steep. Um, after germination, then you have to dry it back down to get it to a preserved level. So that's kilning. So making a basic Pilsner base malt, you're going to dry it down at a low enough temperature to uh, destroy some of the off flavors, some of the grassy kind of flavors, that uh, vegetative flavors that are present, but uh, just uh, enough temperature to get that moisture down and preserve as much enzymes as possible. If you're doing something a little more flavorful like a Munich or Vienna malt, you might go to elevated temperatures and that'll help create flavors but you denature more enzymes and stuff, so then you, you have a uh, little less uh, efficiency in terms of uh, conversion times in the mash tank. Um, so then that's kind of the, uh, yeah, the, the three main processes. And then afterwards you have to clean it, and beforehand you have to clean it. And... So why is this such a critical aspect in the production of beer? So if you didn't have any malt, you could buy commercial enzymes, but... Uh, traditionally there would not have been enzymes available to convert your starches to sugars. Also, it uh, makes the brew day a lot simpler for the brewer. You don't have to worry about a, a cereal mash or a uh, cereal cooker to gelatinize your starches and things of that nature. So you um, you can uh, get your steep water up to whatever your striking temperature is, say 155, 157, wherever you're doing in at, and add your malt. Um, if we didn't have the modification process, they would take their raw grains, which are much harder to mill. They'd mill them down. They'd have to essentially boil them without scorching them and dump them back in and um, add enzymes somehow. So um, that uh, adjunct brewing has been done before the advent of uh, supplemental enzymes. So it can be done with malts, uh, but y you need to malt to make beer. Yep. And yeah, without malt, you wouldn't have alcohol, you wouldn't have body, you wouldn't have color. So it. So there you go. Pretty much the most important aspect of our process here. <laughs> yeah, and, and like water, I feel water and malt are very much overlooked. Yeah, and probably malt even more so than water. <laughs> <laughs> well, not after today, because we're going to have a lot more educated folks out there after listening to this show. So, how do certain malts help brewers achieve specific styles and flavors in the beers they create? Yeah, there's a wide, wide gamut there of malts to make a wide gamut of beers. And um, so if we look at something like maybe wheat beers, like a Hefeweiss versus a Wit. So a Hefeweiss is a malted wheat, and um, a Wit is an unmalted wheat. And so you would use, uh, depending on what style you're trying to, uh, what bucket you're trying to be in there style-wise, you would uh, choose those malts accordingly. So there's uh, def for sure flavors. Uh, there's uh, mouthfeel, head retention aspects of it. Uh, when you get into colored malts, so either crystals or roasted malts, you're going to add color and flavor to the beer. So if we think of uh, if you had a clear stout, well, it, it's kind of a neat novelty. It, it, they're, they're quite interesting. It might not go over well because someone wants a stout, they want to look at something dark. So right. to achieve the, the color you're after, and for the most part, working with uh, brewers around here, color's the most important thing they're going to ask me about the malt, what uh, what SRM I'm expecting out of this malt. And um, it's and it's uh, it's important, like um, going in a grocery store, you see shiny red apples versus a you know, half-warm eaten apple here gonna go for the shiny one you know yeah it, it uh, definitely an important aspect breakneck tavern in mars is the north hills premier destination for culinary greatness they specialize in approachable elevated cuisine featuring sustainable seafood house smoked meats award-winning chicken wings and much much more thirsty breakneck tavern has 40 taps pouring your favorite local and regional craft beers 
as well as a diverse wine and whiskey menu with offerings from around the world. Happy Hour runs 4 to 7 p.m. Monday through Thursday and 5 to 7 p.m. on Friday. Visit www.breakneckTavern.com to learn more and follow them at Breakneck Tavern on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you mentioned color. What are some of the other questions? And when, when a brewery reaches out to you, what, what are the important factors that they're keeping in mind when they're deciding if they want to do business with you to get the malts for their beers? So they're um, going to ask about color. Um, they're going to really notice efficiency generally uh, and yield. Um, so those two words are kind of used somewhat interchangeably. I think of efficiency as how quickly it's converting in the mash tune. A lot of brewers think of efficiency as what their yield is. So they put in so many pounds and they got uh, so many points of specific gravity. So um, yield they're going to notice and they're going to come back if it's a very efficient, very high yielding malt. Um, so that's dollars at the end of the day. Uh, and flavors. So being that we're... The flavor is a hard thing to measure and quantify. So the, the tea we have brewing is going to give us an example of flavor. And if you're super scientific about how your panel tastes and how often they taste and all that, you can quantify flavors and give a, a value to it. Uh, that becomes labor intensive for sure, to say the least. Um, so some of the other aspects that I, I usually report to brewers are going to be the friability. And so what that is, it's the amount of uh, malt that's uh, crushed up in a machine. It measures how uh, well friable it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, indicates the amount of conversion in the, uh, the malt itself. The um, other thing we're going to want to know is the amount of diastatic power of the malt. And so that's usually, for that, we send that off to a lab and it's reported in uh, diastatic power, which is a total amount of conversion, as well as the levels of alpha amylase, which is a particular enzyme that's going to help um, convert starches to sugars. Some of the other things that they might look at is uh, S over T, so that's uh, also called the Kolbosch index, and so that has to do with uh, how much free amino acids and uh, nitrogen you have versus total nitrogen, and that's going to matter in the fermentation side. And um, so all of this contributes towards uh, performance and flavor. So a lot of our barley is European strain. As a matter of fact, it's all European strains of barley. And so they're all bred for all malt brewers. So they have um, lower fan, lower um, S over T ratios, of like 38% or so, versus um, like RAR might be 45%. I probably shouldn't use RAR as an example. I don't know for sure their number. Very high quality malt, but it's made for adjunct brewers, for your traditional... Budweiser, mm -hmm. and if they're doing 600 ton a day for Budweiser, they're not going to try and tweak that for, you know. Yeah, say, why would they, right? <laughs> yeah, for Butler, Allegheny County, yeah. first. <laughs> so um, when you have those, uh, the higher S over T, you're getting um, more rapid fermentations, but then if you have more nitrogen stuff in there for the yeast and you could have more kind of off more I, I think of it as like home brewer kind of flavors like that uh, uh, and I should take more flavor classes <laughs> to, to explain this better but uh, off flavors right um, from fermentation now I guess the the last thing that we might look at is the uh, the sizing of the barley so brewers want to set their mill and be done and mill everything up. And there's, I don't know of anyone who's got has a four roller mill here. So pretty much everyone has two roller mills. So they're going to mill their grain and it's going to fall through. And if there's a lot of fines, then kernels are not going to get milled. And they're going to be floating. So um, we want to, uh, we take care of that on the cleaning end where we clean out all the fines and uh, they go somewhere else and the brewers get all the plumps, which are generally higher yielding as well. And they're going to mill up better. I'm sure there's something else I'm forgetting. <laughs> malt spec sheets are quite large and most people don't uh, get into that much detail already. So what are some of the specific grains that you guys have malted here at CNC? 
Well, of course, barley. That's uh, sure. Barley's the best. <laughs> we like barley. <laughs> is we, there a specific reason why? Yes. Um, so barley is about perfect for making beer and whiskeys. It has the husk intact, so that aids in your filtration. There's a lot of um, enzymatic power in a well-modified brewing variety of barley. There's uh, a, a lot of uh, carbohydrates for sugars in barley. Um, some of the other grains, like uh, rye, for example, they have uh, high levels of arabilazine, which is um, makes it very sticky, and they don't have any enzyme to break that down, or if it's present, it's present in a very low amount. So, uh, while rye can be used in beer and can be used up to 100%, it gets more tricky to work with. Barley just has everything it needs within itself to make a good mash and a good beer. Some of the other grains, back to your question mm-hmm. of uh, what we malted, one of the first ones we ever did was a, an ancient wheat called einkorn, and um, I, I kind of didn't want to do that, and I really shouldn't have started there, <laughs> but uh, that one didn't work so well. Um, it uh, made, it was very fine kernels and a lot of dust, and it made a paste in there, couldn't get through it, and it kind of soured here and there and everywhere. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, we'll, we'll give it a go again here eventually. But uh, on the other side of ancient grains, we did uh, spelts, um, and we like spelts a lot. But that was the one that, uh, as I was telling you, um, you have to get them wet, and they float in water okay. when they're whole. So uh, we're working on making spelts better. So what you have to do is get them out of their hole, dehole them, and uh, then they'll they'll hydrate better. All right. Uh, we did wheat, of course, rye, corn. Oats. Oats are very fun because they're light and easy to shovel. Now, in regards to extract brewing, do you guys have any connection to that whatsoever? So to make extract, I I buy a lot of equipment from auction. And um, to make uh, malt extract, you need a lot of equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically you mash and brew, and then you have to drive off all the water. That's typically done with like a falling film evaporator, which is um, a big piece of equipment. So on top of needing all the brewing equipment, you not all the brewing equipment, but a mash tune anyway, you need to uh, be able to drive off that water. And I just don't see us getting there in the next few years. Doesn't mean eventually we won't be doing malt extracts. I was just curious because it seems like, I mean, if I... If I'm recalling right, like home brewers typically, you, are you? That that's the I don't want to say the main mm-hmm. source of. Well, um, <laughs> you know, along those lines, though, there are breweries that are extract breweries opening up. Interesting. Yeah, it, it, I think that's the best word. Interesting. Yeah, so, we'll see where it goes. Right. So, where do you guys source the grains that you malt here at CNC? So we. A source most of it locally. Eighty um, percent of it's Pennsylvania grown, twenty uh, percent Ohio grown. Uh, being we're right here by Ohio, we try and spread our farming acreage out across the state somewhat. So there could be a, a rainstorm or a hail event or something here that uh, leads to a crop failure. So to kind of split our risks, we we do uh, diversify in as far away as York and. Uh, to the east and as far away as uh, Cleveland to the west. Um, really haven't had to go north or south too much more. It seems yeah. this, this band's about ideal for barley. Um, some of the fields, there's 20 acres right across the street there. I don't know if we'll get a chance to look at them today or not, but uh, it's um, we have people growing here in Butler County. We have people growing down in Washington County, up in uh, Sandy Lake. We have uh, quite a few. There's a big farm out in Indiana, PA, that's uh, going to start storing our barley now, and they'll probably start farming for us here this year. There's a guy over uh, in Armstrong County who's uh, working with some barley we're super excited about, and um, it's from the flavor side. It's a a company called LCS, Lima Grains, and I believe they're uh, French um, in their origin. Uh, and the reason I'm excited about this goes back to uh, 
uh, competition that uh, we had entered in back in uh, February is called the Malt Cup. So it was the first ever Malt Cup, and uh, pretty much every malt house in the world was invited to participate. And the top three winners were uh, all craft malt houses, and they were all using this um, variety. Uh, They're all using LCS grains, and um, and so. We didn't get the particular variety that finished first or second. I think we got the, or excuse me, first and third were the same, and second was a different variety. So we got the second place variety awesome. to trial here. Congratulations. So, yeah. How, how many malt houses are in the world and that were there competing? Um, I don't know the number of entrants there. Um, so it uh, the way this was through the Craft Maltsters Guild, mm-hmm. and the way they have it set up was that so to be a member of the craft malting guild, you have to be a craft malt house to be a full member. You could be an allied member if you are, uh, so like Malt Europe, um, Brees, uh, those guys are allied members. So they're too big to really be considered craft, but... Um, is it almost like the scale of how a brewer, the Brewers Association determines whether a brewery is a craft brewery? Yeah, uh, kind of. I, I think uh, we're something like 5,000 ton a year or something's cut off for craft. I, I Don't quote me on that number. I'd have to look it up. But there, uh, okay. yeah, there is a cutoff number where okay. you're no longer craft malt and you're an allied member, I guess. So back to the who all entered, I'm not sure. Yeah. And how many malt houses there are in the world, I, I'm not 100% sure. So when um, I could say in the U.S. on the craft malt side, there's about 100 to 160 craft malt houses. Okay. Now, when I started, there was five. Um, so I guess it, I, it, it to me, it, it must be like a supply and demand type of thing with the growth of the more breweries, you're going to need more, more craft more, more supply right. chain, right? So it, exactly. Um, yeah. kind of like the, um, the Alaskan gold rush, right? There's a lot of prospectors and there had yeah. to be people selling picks and shovels and dynamite. So absolutely right. Now, major malt houses, when I, I want to say there's probably about 30 to 60 industrial size malt houses worldwide. So if you consider four or five years ago, there was maybe a total of 65 malt houses. Yeah. Now there's a total of uh, maybe 200 total <laughs> malt houses worldwide. So yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's a, a growing industry. Absolutely. And um, part of that goes to craft beer too. So we're uh, now adjuncts are, are allowed in craft beer. Um, craft beer whether they're using adjuncts or not are still using more malt than industrial beer just because that's uh, how they do it right <laughs> so um but uh, to your question as to how many uh malt houses entered i'd s- say most of the craft malt houses entered and a few of the allied members entered as well as far as the competition goes there was uh, a qualifying round where you had to uh meet all the lab numbers so your malt had to be of uh commercial grade i guess you'd say yeah and then um there was uh three rounds of tasting we made it to the second round so it's uh not not too bad is this something you plan on participating in again yeah yeah and um like i said being the the top three finishers all had the same base barley the same strain of barley we're uh we're hunting out that strain and experimenting with it now to see how well it performs in pennsylvania yeah. and i don't think we covered this in the beginning how long have you guys been operating here uh, we've been making malt for over a year. We've been trying to make malt and get going. There's a, a lot of uh, stuff that goes with uh, renovating old school, starting a business and all that. So Yeah, I think that's one thing we, we should point out, too, to, for all of our listeners. We're, we're sitting in the old kindergarten room. That's correct. Of, uh, what school was this back uh, in the Clearfield day? Clearfield Township Elementary. Yeah. So. A lot of room for activities. Yeah. Clearly, uh, being an old school, but it's really, it was really neat because where, where you guys have your, so I'm assuming That's that right. was the gym. And <laughs> yeah, we could play horseshoe or whatever as yeah. we wait for the kiln to finish. <laughs> But great stuff. So yeah, I mean that that's that's great progress for just being or being in operation for a little over a year. So well, thank keep, you. Keep up the great work. We will. And yeah, on behalf of all the beer drinkers out there, thank you for playing such a key role in putting this great liquid in front of us and helping the breweries get hooked up with good good grain and good malted grain and yeah, keep it a, coming. Keep it coming. Supporting our local farmers too. We can't forget them. Oh, it's absolutely a, not. 
It's uh, rewarding to see them out there in their 1964 International <laughs> Combine, <Yeah>. whatever they're <laughs> taking in the crop with. So, so we've got a, a, a good knowledge base built here for you guys. If you've been wondering about this process, how it contributes to the creation of beer, you, now you know. If you'd like to learn more about CNC, Brendan, where can we reach out to find you guys on the World Wide Web? Well, www.cncmalt.com. All right. And, and I know you guys are on Instagram and Twitter yeah, as we well. Yeah, we do. And um, you can communicate that way. It's um, I, I'm not very good at social media. My wife's helping me out tremendously. <laughs> I, I hadn't partaken in that since 2004 when I got on Facebook and got off Facebook. But yeah, So I'm learning. Yep, the, <laughs> the, the best way to get a hold of me is to call uh, the cell phone and you look up the number on the web or... Um, however you like. Uh, I'll put links in all the show notes, so if you guys have any questions or if you're a brewery that is looking for a good source of grain, we're going to give you an opportunity to connect directly to Brennan. So thanks a lot for taking a few minutes to share with us the process of malting. Again, very crucial element to the craft beer process. So again, we're going to dive into all of the different aspects that put that liquid together and put it in the glass in front of you. So again, Brendan from CNC Malt, thanks for taking some time today. And we will uh, see you again down the road. Thanks for coming out. All right, boys and girls, that is a wrap on session 22 of the Breaking Brews podcast. Once again, a big thank you to Brendan Carroll for coming on the show and dropping some great knowledge about malting. Episodes will be rolling out here on the Breaking Brews podcast talking about the different ingredients in beer. So as I said at the top of the show, stay tuned for an episode about hops, about water, and about yeast in upcoming episodes of the podcast. So you and I have a seven-day break before we once again reconvene around the speakers to listen to session 23 of the podcast That gives you a full week to jump back in the archives, check out what's happening with the Breaking Brews podcast from sessions 1 through 21. You can share the episodes on Twitter, on friends, tell your family, tell your colleagues, tell a beer enthusiast about the Breaking Brews podcast, tell a beer professional how much you're learning from the show. You can drop some feedback at Breaking Brews Co. on Instagram and Twitter. Also find Breaking Brews on Facebook. And if you haven't done so already, join the new Breaking Brews Podcast Central Facebook group. I've been dropping some videos in there. We're going to have exclusive content that will be released only on that page. I've done a couple interviews already that have dropped via Facebook Live through the Breaking Brews Podcast Central group. Upcoming, I'm looking to have these episodes that you have listened to in the past and all future episodes available on YouTube. And on the Breaking Brews Podcast Central Facebook group, I'll be dropping some content that doesn't make it to the actual episodes, will be available only for you via being part of the Facebook group. So go join up today. Looking forward to having you part of the Facebook group. So next week, session 23 of the Breaking Brews Podcast. You heard her voice on session three talking about production management. You also heard her on session 19 as we talked about event planning and putting together a kick-ass beer event. Lauren Baker of the Harmony Inn will once again be joining me on the Breaking Brews podcast. When Lauren and I recorded this episode, she was in the production management role at North Country Brewing. Since then, if you listen to Session 19, you've learned that Lauren has transitioned to the general manager position at the Harmony Inn, which is a bar and restaurant owned by North Country Brewing in the small town of Harmony, which is right outside of Slippery Rock, where their production facility is located. So Lauren and I talked about beer politics and a lot of the ins and outs of the beer industry that are behind the scenes. So we're going to dive deep into that next week. And there's some good content for you to listen to there. Lauren goes into some detail about some of the experiences that she both in Pennsylvania and in her past days in the state of Texas. So session 23, once again, we'll be joined by Miss Lauren Baker. Looking forward to what she has to say. So that's going to do it for session 22 of the Breaking Brews podcast. I know I did. This is Jason Sircone. Until next week, this has been the Word of the Porch.